And now for something different. I'm doing the message this weekend. If you're new here and you don't know who I am, I'm Father Michael White, the pastor, and we're glad you're here. If you are new, we'd love to meet you. If you're joining us online, you can text the word welcome to the number on your screen. And if you're here in our sanctuary, we'll meet you out on the concourse at the Welcome Center after Mass. Either way, we have someone to greet you and something to give you. I just want to take a moment, first of all, to thank Daniel Miller, Brian Crook, and most especially Tom Corcoran from our staff for all their efforts this summer to bring us such engaging and challenging messages week after week, not to mention giving me a break from preaching for the summer season. I think they did an outstanding job, and I'm very grateful to them. As the summer season sadly comes to a close, I will be finishing up this series this week and next, which will help me get back in shape for preaching this fall. By the way, if you've missed any or all of this series or you'd like to share a message with a friend, you can find them all online on demand. Check it out, as always, on our website. Also, I did want to update you on our assistance to Haiti in light of the recent earthquake. If you were with us last week, you know that we tithed our collection, and the tithe, together with some specifically designated offerings we also received, amounted to just over $37,000. So, just terrific. We'll be, we'll be splitting that amount with our mission partners, 410 Bridge and Catholic Relief Services. Meanwhile, thanks to everyone who supported us. We're in the fifth and final week, uh, no, the fifth week, next week is the final week, of our current series looking at uh, the mission we share with the Lord, the mission given to us by the Lord to seek and save the lost. Now, if you've been around here any amount of time, you know we talk about that all the time. It's also the motivation behind so much of what we do here. We built this building. We pour efforts and resources into music, message, and ministers. We invest in staff and technology, facilities, and infrastructure, all for the purpose of reaching out to people who are lost, people who do not have a connection with Christ and his church. To seek and save the lost, we invest and invite. Also, a phrase you hear a lot around here. We invest in people who are far from God, and then when we have the opportunity, we simply invite them to our weekend environments for adults, kids, and students, whether here on Ridgely Road or online. We make that invitation because we believe, we think, it is precisely, exactly in these environments that we can most effectively, most compellingly make the case for Christ. To help remind us of this purpose of our parish. In the course of this series, we've been taking a look at the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel. In that chapter, Jesus tells three parables, three stories about something lost being found. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. In fact, we have been taking a long look at that one, the story of the lost, or so-called prodigal son. We've looked at the son, we've looked at the, the son's father, but there's another character in the story, another son, an older son, and we're introduced to him right at the start of the story. A man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. The younger brother demands his inheritance, and the father gives it to him. We've already reflected that the son's request is simply outrageous. 
And the father's response is astounding. And as astounding as it strikes us, it was ten times more so to Jesus' audience, given their patriarchal culture. But here's something else that strikes me as strange, and it's easy to miss. At least I've missed it in previous readings. It's the reaction of the older son, or rather his lack of reaction. He says nothing. His silence is deafening. Silence usually implies consent, and his silence suggests at the very least indifference. He is indifferent to the dysfunction and division in his family. Worse still, Middle Eastern culture had a very specific, a very traditional role for the eldest son to play in the life of the family, and he utterly fails to fulfill this role. As the older brother, it was his solemn responsibility and duty before God to step in and mediate this situation, and he doesn't do it. He doesn't speak up for his father or provide any support, and he offers no counsel or correction for his brother. So, in the very introduction to the story, we already understand the younger brother by what he does and the older brother by what he fails to do. Well, we've already uh, read these past weeks about the younger brother's fall from grace and his eventual reunion and reconciliation with the father. But after the younger son's story is told, the focus shifts to the older brother. Take a look. The older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. You know, this is where I find myself sympathizing with the older brother. He's out there simply doing his job. The younger brother is a complete train wreck, but this guy is just doing his job, and I identify with that. Maybe you do too. Actually, this story means for us to identify with the older brother. Jesus is telling this story to the Pharisees, the professional church people of his day, and they would definitely have associated with the older brother. We just heard about them in the gospel reading that Father Nicholas read for us today. They considered themselves morally and religiously superior to others, actually to everyone. And definitely, they set themselves up not only as the ultimate religious rule keepers, but also the ultimate judges of just how well everybody else was keeping the rules. Of course, their standards for others were always higher than those they applied to, to themselves. But hey, what's a little hypocrisy among friends, right? He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, your brother has returned and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Perhaps the servant was excited to share what could be considered good news by others, but not to this guy. He became angry and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in, in reply, look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders, yet you never once gave me a goat to feast on with my friends. These verses show us the heart of the older brother. He becomes angry and refuses to enter his father's house. That was an insult to the father in itself, made worse because it happens in front of the father's guests. The father has to leave his guests and his party to plead with his son. Think about that, a further humiliation for the father. And it only gets worse from there as his son proceeds to tell him off. He begins, look, look here, listen up, buddy. This is not how sons speak to fathers, then 
or now. It's insulting, but it's also deeply revealing. The elder brother reveals why he worked for his father, not out of love and respect or even duty and honor. He worked for the father to earn what he then considered only his due. As far as he was concerned, this father-son relationship was merely transactional. While the younger brother rebelled to get money, the older brother obeyed to get it. Neither cared about the relationship. And while both attitudes are equally wrong, they're not equally dangerous. I would argue that the elder brother's attitude is far more dangerous. And the danger is a warning for us in our relationship with God. You know, when you act like the younger brother and you walk away from God and the church, it's clear what you're doing. You're walking away from God and the church. It's regrettable, at least I think so. And it can lead to even more regrettable things. It did for the younger brother. But it's clear what it is. Far less clear, far darker and denser, far more dangerous, perhaps, is to stay in the church, ostensibly in a relationship with God, but not really, carefully obeying all the rules, at least the ones you choose to obey, and checking all the boxes. Like the older son beginning to think that God owes you for your religious rule-keeping. You fulfill your obligation, and because you do so, you have a sense of entitlement for whatever it is you're coming here for, for whatever it is you're after, grace and favor, blessing, health, healing, heaven. Just listen to the entitlement of the older son. All these years I served you. Another translation says, all these years I slaved for you. The older brother has been keeping accounts with his father for a very long time. And clearly, he finds the father owing him heavily in his debt. With the older brother, it's not his wrongdoing that keeps him out of his father's house. It's his self-righteousness. And having turned on his father, next he turns on his brother. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughtered the fattened calf. Notice he says, your son. Thus does he distance himself from the other members of the family. But more than that, he's driving a wedge between his brother and his father. The older brother is trying to make the younger brother look bad. Admittedly, a pretty easy thing to do. And doubtless, at this point, the guests inside the house have drifted outside, forming an audience to watch this angry, ugly exchange. Because, hey, who doesn't enjoy watching the dysfunction of someone else's family? It's irresistible. The older brother is creating disruption and division between the brothers, between the brothers and the father, between the father and his guests. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. A lady stopped me after the last Mass to tell me what she was thinking. (laughs) I don't agree with you. That's what you're thinking. I hear what you're saying, but I still feel like the older brother has a point. It just doesn't seem fair that the father would throw this lavish party for his irresponsible son. I don't buy it. I don't get it. It's not fair. You know what? You're absolutely right. It's not fair. And you know what else? You don't want fair. Don't ever ask for fair. The gospel never promises or pretends to be fair. Whether we're currently acting like the older brother or the younger one, you and I are loved by God more than we know. 
more than we deserve, way more than we'll ever, ever earn, and way more than fair. At the beginning of the message, I mentioned that it should have been the older brother who went out and, and sought out the lost brother, bringing him home. But putting a flawed older brother into the story, Jesus is inviting us to imagine another brother, a different brother, a truer brother. And it doesn't take much imagination. Our brother doesn't just go to great lengths to, to bring us home. Our brother goes to every length. He goes to the cross. Jesus is the true older brother, and he invites his friends and followers to follow his lead in that role. Doing so is actually one of the hallmarks of Christian maturity and growth in discipleship. So think about this. Over the course of this series, we've been encouraging you to take responsibility for people who are not your responsibility, but who are disconnected from Christ and His church. And probably at no time in our collective experience are there more people disconnected. Even many people who pre-COVID were church people are gone. Take a look around. They're no longer here. And they're not necessarily or automatically coming back. But we have an important opportunity close at hand to do something about that. One of our very favorite weekends of the year is kickoff weekend in two weeks, September 11th and 12th. It's a perfect time to invite someone you know to join us online or in person. And if you'll make the invitation, I'll make this promise. We promise to deliver. We promise to deliver a relevant and inspiring message. At least, I'll do my best. Outstanding new music, amazing kids and student programs all back in session, finally, in our newly re renovated theater, and a few surprises to amaze you. Think about it. Why not use kickoff weekend as the perfect weekend to introduce or reintroduce someone to their father's house. Let's stand and pray together. God, our Father, we rejoice to be called your sons and daughters. Help us to lead those who are far from you back home to you. In all things and through all things, may we serve you by serving one another. We pray as always through Christ our Lord. Have a great week.